Greetings, everyone. I'm Pastor Joel Pledge from Crossroads Assembly of God in Three Way, Tennessee. We're right here in the heart of West Tennessee, and we're so glad that you join us for this Facebook Live broadcast. We have been, we are in a series of on prayer and worship, and we have been studying the Lord's Prayer. We've come to the third petition of the first part of that prayer. It's, you know, it's our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're there, right there at thy will be done. Um, obviously, God's will is done in heaven. God speaks, it's done. God makes an instruction that happens. We ask that question, or not ask the question, but we, we do ask the question of who hinders God's will from being done on the earth. Okay? Think about it for just a moment. His will is done in heaven. What hinders his will upon the earth? Well, some people are going to say, well, that's the devil. That's his work. He opposes everything that God does. And uh, in some ways, they're right. Others would say, well, that's Adam's fault. He sinned. And uh, he brought the curse of sin upon us. And, and it was Adam's will that's the problem. But the reality is, is that it is yours and mine. Hmm. There might be a few more people um, included if we in include only believers watching this. But the truth is, is that what hinders God's will upon this earth is the human race. We're rebellious to the core. Everywhere we look, we see example of example of those who have, who have fought against the will of God for their lives and for the earth itself. You know, <clears throat> when Jesus gave... Um, this this model prayer, he was in agreement with the rest of Judaism at that time. His, um, uh, here's a, a, a Jewish prayer from that day. Do thy will in heaven above and give rest of spirit to them that fear beneath. May it be thy will, O Lord our God, to establish peace in the upper family and in the lower family. What a beautiful expression, isn't it? the upper family, the lower family, heaven and earth. And it is similar to what they're praying. Let, let, uh, you know, I, there may be some question there of whether they believe the will of God was being done in heaven. Uh, but, but Jesus says it is. God's will is being done in heaven, and let it be done on the earth. We're the only thing stopping it. If we look around the world today, we would also see that we... we there's part of our culture and our world that coincides with the Greek and Roman world of Jesus' day. There was a Stoic view in his time that, um, that said it is a matter of prudence, not, just, not only piety, to bring the human will into compliance and harmony with the divine will. All right? <laughs> um, I... <clears throat> One of their sayings went like this. This is a Stoic saying. Do not seek to have anything that happens happen as you wish, but wish for everything to happen as it actually does happen, and your life will be serene. Well, that's kind of que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Whatever happens, be happy with it, because you can't change it anyway. This is the stoic mind. You, you don't get happy. You don't get sad. You just stay the same all the time because you don't know what's around the corner. Maybe good, maybe bad. You just never, never know. In the world today, we have, um, we, we, we have uh, many different ideas, and, and, and all of them are really in response for, uh, to this question, does God have a plan for me. It's a very important thing. Does God have a will for my life? Well, you know, there's some people, atheists, basically, who will say God does not exist. And therefore, he is not active upon the earth. He doesn't work in my life. He doesn't work on the global level. There's an agnostic that says maybe he, he's exi he exists, 
but he is indifferent to our lives. He's kind of like the, uh, uh, well, he just doesn't care, doesn't care. There may be casual believers, and there's many people who believe in God, but just don't believe that he does anything upon the earth. His will is done in heaven, but nothing on the earth. It's the old deist belief in the clockmaker that God has created this as a clock maker is, will, will fashion a clock and then stand back and watch it, watches it run. You don't have to do anything but watch it run. There are people who believe, and maybe these are people who go to church and they believe that God exists, but that our prayers make no difference, our faith makes no difference. God only acts sovereignly. He only does what he wants to do. And uh, that's one level of belief. There are also those, and I count myself among those, who believe that God exists and that he acts in response to my faith and in, 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 in accordance with his will. Obviously, that's true. Amen? I believe that God acts in our lives, that he does have a plan for our lives, that he does have a will that is expressed. I, I'll, I'll give to you... Um, two verses of scripture that I are two passages of scripture that I believe are very important for us. Um, let me give you this first one here. It says this: It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that He that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Did you hear that? God rewards those. He's active in your life. He has a will for your life. He responds to your prayers. He responds to your faith. Okay. Sometimes um, we sometimes we separate those two, but in, in reality, if you're praying, you you have to have faith. There, there's just there's oh, we would we could argue this this point, but I believe prayer is a an expression of faith that that God rewards those that seek Him. God rewards those that pray. If, I, if I'm if i praying, then I have faith that God will reward that prayer. Now, sometimes we pray in unbelief. Sometimes we pray uh, amiss. We're praying for the wrong things. And and even though we're praying, we're, we're, we're missing the mark with God. But the reality is, is that God is active in response to our faith. You believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Another passage of scripture that I would share, and that's <laughs> that's good too, <clears throat> comes from <clears throat> Luke 18 and 1, where Jesus uh, is telling this story to uh, telling a story to his disciples that they should always pray and never give up. <clears throat> Luke 18, 1, Jesus tells the story of a a poor uh, widow woman. <clears throat> who who goes to the judge every day asking for her uh, asking for justice asking for her request to be uh, to be given and and that judge puts her off every day every day and but after a while he finally says give this woman what she wants because she's driving me crazy well <laughs> Jesus says you know this man was an unjust judge and he did what was right. If you pray, if you cry out day and night, don't you think that God will surely give justice to, to you, to his chosen people? Don't you think God will hear your prayers? And the answer is yes, and he will, he will answer on your, on your behalf. Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus says, you know, um, uh, 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 how, uh, he, he asked this question, how many people will I find who truly have faith when I return? Um, it, it is this call to faithfulness and to prayer and to persistent prayer, consistent prayer, calling out to him. Those two passages of Scripture, both dealing with faith and, and with prayer, give to me this idea that God does answer prayer and he works on behalf of those who ask? I could go to a lot of different verses, but I believe these two are very important for us to realize that God has a will for your life. 
God has a will for my life, and that if I pray, that will will happen in my life. Not only that, but whatever I am praying for, God will answer. It's very important. Now, I, I'm a realist in, in this regard. And I tell you that there's, there's, there is life and death in the world. There's health and there's sickness. There's good times of plenty and there's times in which we struggle. Now listen, I've faced them all. I've been healed in my body from time to time. I've faced uh, poverty. I've faced uh, uh, life uh, with, with very little. And I've also faced life with, with plenty, more than enough to spare. I recognize that even though that there are those um, opposing views, okay, there's life and death, there's sickness and there's, there's health, that I should always pray in faith. I should pray persistently. I pray asking God for what I need until that moment that God says, you know, I have a different plan for you. There's times in which God has a different plan. Jesus faced that in the garden when he prayed, Lord, you know, if there's any way for this cup of suffering, this crucifixion and death to be passed, if I could just pass by this, if there's any way that I could uh, avoid this, please let it be. Not my will. That's my will. Let's get by this. But yours be done. In other words, God the Father had a different plan for Jesus. There's a lot of different plans. Not all of them are life and death, and not all of them are the are the difference between suffering and, and not suffering, or between uh, having something and not having something. You know, Peter had a different plan uh, in Acts chapter 10. He is he's resting uh, on the sea, sea shore, and uh, he's having a, uh, about to have some some lunch, and and a man comes to him and says, "Hey, come to Cornelius' household. The Lord has sent us." And Peter's never been to a Gentile's house. Peter's never preached to a Gentile. Peter has never seen uh, preached to anyone except of the Jewish faith. And he goes to that house at the urging of the Lord because God had a different plan. Up to that moment in the book of Acts, from chapter one to verse, chapter ten, <clears throat> maybe some Gentiles have been saved. We just don't know about them yet. But in chapter ten. There's an open door to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world. And it happens through, hey, one of the key leaders of, uh, of the Jewish, uh, the Christian Jewish community. And I, I phrase that correctly. Uh, Peter is a Jew. He is a believer in Christ, but he is a Jew. and He's following uh, the, the law and, and fulfilling every requirement. But he opens the door. And when he preaches that day, I believe the Holy Spirit interrupts his preaching to fill the house with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in tongues. They prophesied. He did it so that there would be no doubt, this is my will. This is my plan, Peter. This is not your plan. Peter would have called for a, for a water baptism. Instead, he, these are filled with the Holy Spirit. And he says, can we refuse these people baptism? No, 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 you cannot. You cannot, because they received the Holy Spirit just as we have on the day of Pentecost. So there were two wills or two plans, and God says, I want my plan to be done. You know, Paul had the same thing in Acts 16. He's praying. He's wanting to go, he's wanting to go east in, in, into Galatia, into what we know as Asia Minor, and, 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 and uh, God restrains him. The Holy Spirit restrains him, not once, but uh, a couple of times he wrestles in prayer with what to do. He's wanting get to get permission from God to go into Asia. And God restrains him until finally he has a vision of a man calling from Macedonia, come over here and help us. Come over here and help us. He goes to the city of Philippi and opens a door to that area of the world. Paul had a plan. Here's where we're going. We're saving our money. We're saving our supplies. We're planning to go. We're going east. And God says, no, I want you to go west. One of the most famous ones in Paul comes out of 2 Corinthians 12, as Paul has um, a thorn in the flesh. We don't know. I think it was a sickness. 
It was perhaps uh, his uh, poor eyesight. We know he had poor eyesight. And God, um, he prays three times. And God doesn't take this thorn away or this sickness away. And instead, God says to him, my grace is sufficient. Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, for in your weakness, my power is perfected. Um, God had a different plan. I don't like to say God said no. I just think God had a different plan. Here's a yes. Let me give you a yes to this. I'm going to do this a different way, Paul. And I believe it's true in our lives as well. For the sick, if I'm praying for the sick, I'm always going to pray for healing unless the Lord has definitely spoken uh, to them or to me otherwise. I know that many times I've prayed that in a hospital room and and they would be um, gone in a day or in just a short time. But I believe until we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is it, my time has come, that we should pray in faith consistently, believing that the Lord re rewards those who diligently seek him. I pray it, I, I, I believe it's important for us to pray that way because we don't want to uh, offend God. I don't want to offend God. God is able. God is able to raise the dead. Okay? There's no sickness that he cannot heal. Don't say it's too far gone. Don't say it's too far gone. Don't say it's too far gone. That's not a, a problem with your screen, your television. I repeated that three times. Uh, don't say this situation is too far gone. My life is too far gone. My sickness is too too acute. God, whatever God says, that is what is important. And so I'm going to believe in faith for healing until God says, I've got a different plan. And I've prayed people into heaven. I've been with them as they go, and it is a glorious thing. So I know that there is no fear in death, and I, I, I'm not afraid of death at all. And I just believe that God has uh, for us instruction that says, if someone is sick, you pray for them to be healed until we know that it is God's will for something different. Um, I know that praying for the lost, there's a definite yes. If someone is not serving the Lord, we can pray for them with great boldness because it is the will of God for them to be saved. I believe it is the will of God for us to experience spiritual life, revival, um, expansion, growth throughout the whole world, to preach this gospel boldly wherever we go. I know it's the will of God for us to live a holy life. Therefore, we can pray for strength. We can pray for holiness. We can pray for deliverance. We can pray for life. I think it's very important for us to know God has a plan for our lives. Amen? Amen. Well, I want us to consider just for a, a, another moment the global implications again. I kind of started there. What is hindering God's will upon the earth? And I, I want you to know, again, that all of heaven does the will of the Father. No doubt in my mind. Uh, we up on the earth, earth, earth's inhabitants do not. We're the exception to the rule. So when we pray this prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it is, first of all, to align the inhabitants of the earth with God's plan and his will. This is both evangelism and, I believe, divine intervention. I believe that we know that God is not willing that any should perish. Let me throw that verse on, uh, on the screen there. God, the Lord, isn't really slow about his promise, Peter says, as some people think. Well, he is patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Amen? Oh, he's talking about the end times of the day of the Lord as people say, where is this return of Christ? And Peter says, you don't understand God. He loves this world. Oh, he sent his only begotten son into this world. Oh, that we might be saved. Amen. That we might have everlasting life. He's not willing to, to banish anyone uh, to hell. Um, but he's patient. Therefore, the delay to the return of Christ but he, he is going to come, my friends. Jesus is going to come, so we have to be ready. So we're praying for evangelism. We're praying for people to come to Christ. 
We're praying for the kingdom to come. We're praying for that will to be done. And it is by earth's inhabitants, the will of God to be done by earth's in, inhabitants. I do believe this is a kingdom mindset. we got to have a kingdom mindset. What is God doing today in the world? Not just about my life, but to look out and see what's God doing today in the world. What, how can we align ourselves with the plan of God in the world? Amen? Not every time you get a bonus should it go to your, um, to, to, to your toys and your, your extra stuff. This fall, um, God bless me, or I realized that I was blessed of God, and, and I, I wrote a couple of checks to missions and sent that to Mongolia, and we helped to, to build a, a pastor a home and helped to remodel a, a daycare center. And it's all because God gave me something. I realized, hey, that's not for me to consume it upon my own desire, but for me to give. And sometimes we have to see we're joining in to God's plan. Amen? We're joining in to God's plan upon the earth. I do believe that we should be praying for human government all over the world. I do believe we should be praying for the church all over the world. I mean, there's a lot of the church that's under persecution. I believe we want it to stand up boldly for Christ. Uh, I want it to be protected. I plead the blood, but I understand. Boy, I understand God in this. I understand that God has a plan and a purpose beyond that, which I cannot understand. I want everybody to be at peace. I want everybody to have freedom to preach and go to church and give and serve. But God says, my way of accomplishing my will to see people saved sometimes is through a persecuted church. I don't know why. I, I, I just know that he does that, that, that there is sometimes great revival in that place where the gospel is opposed. So this praying for the will of God, it's, it involves that missionary activity. We're looking for evangelism. We're looking for God to work through his church uh, around the world. Um, in, in the mind of God, all of these things are global. Okay, God is looking at the big picture. Okay, God's looking at the big picture. And, and I, I just look at Acts chapter 9 as, an, as my example tonight. Because here's a man, we know him here as, as, as Saul. This is his Hebrew name. We know him later as Paul, wrote most of the New Testament, great missionary. But in Acts chapter 9, he's, he's still going by his Hebrew name, Saul. And he's um, got orders from the high priest to go to Damascus to persecute or to arrest the Christians there. Probably going to bring them back to Jerusalem for trial. He's going to per persecute the church. And, um, and, and you know, um, on his way, he's going to see a vision of Christ and he's going to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. And he is, he's going to become part, a believer, part of that church. Okay, now listen, I, I, I'm almost positive without a shadow of a doubt that there was no one praying for the salvation of Saul in Damascus. They might have been praying for safety. They might have been praying about where to hide. They might have been praying that something would stop Saul from coming. They knew he was coming. I mean, the gossip is, is there. They were expecting him. Ananias, who was the, the one that God sent to pray for Saul so that he could be healed, baptized in water filled with the Holy Spirit. And Ananias says, well, Lord, I don't want to go to him. I, I, I don't want to go to him. I've heard he's coming. I've heard he's a bad man. I, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Well, Ananias had one will. <laughs> God had another. Wait a minute, he's praying right now. If you'll go right now, he's praying to me, you'll be an answer to his prayer. Um, do you understand? We're praying globally. Many times we're just praying about our needs and locally. We're only praying, oh God, save me from that man Saul. Lord, save me from, from being persecuted. Lord, hide me away under the cover of your wings. And God is saying, pray for this man to be saved. Very few of us think about that. God's will was for Saul to be saved, to become a witness to the Gentiles, to kings all over the earth, and to his own 
uh, unto God's own chosen people. Again, I refer back to Acts chapter 10 as Peter had, had his own will and his own ideas. He was not praying about going to the Gentiles. He was not praying about going to a, a Roman centurion's home. But the Lord had a plan. A plan that opened the door to the salvation of all the earth. I want you to see and to understand God has a plan. Amen? God has a plan. Well, uh, let me get that back up here. Uh, why is this will so important? And I want you to see that, that God emphasizes this, and I, I'm just going to come from the book of Matthew. It's probably other places that I could come. But the will of God is very important. Why should I be praying this will of God in, my, in the world and in my life? Okay? Talk about that in just a moment. Why is it important? And let me share with you four passages of Scripture. Okay? Uh, first is Matthew 20, 12, 21 and 23. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is, he's talking about eternity here, okay? Talking about heaven itself. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. It's very important for us to realize here, okay? Did you hear those words? Hmm. Only those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Why is the will of God important? Well, because it's the key to getting into heaven, okay? It's the key to getting into heaven. I need to pray, Lord, thy will be done in my life. Why? Because it's the key to me getting into heaven. I, I can do a lots of things for God. I can work for God. I can minister for God. I can give to the poor. I can, I can help all the people that I can help. But you can't get into heaven without doing the will of God. And those, things, those things may be the will of, uh, of God on one level, but they're not what God asks you to do. Believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. Believe in, in Jesus as Lord and serve him. If you don't do those things, then uh, there's no key given to you for heaven. Amen. Well, let me give you the next passage. Matthew 12, 46 uh, uh, through 50. As Jesus was speaking to this crowd, his brother, mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. This is after the Sermon on the Mount. No, it's not after the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this is Matthew 12. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are standing outside they want to speak to you. Jesus says, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Wow, what a dramatic statement there. I don't think Jesus is trying to disrespect his mother or even his brothers, even though I, it may be as brothers go. I believe he's saying to us that when you do the will of the Father, you become part of the family. Amen. When you do the will of the Father, you become my brother. I'll be your elder brother. We become part of the family of God, our Father, which art in heaven. We are part. How do I become a fam part of that family? I do the will of the Father. I need to be praying that will be done in my life. Another passage, boy, I tell you, this is, this is really uh, important. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go out and search for the one that is lost? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he will rejoice over it more than the 99 that didn't wander away. In the same way, it is not my Heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. Let me read the next passage from Matthew 21, 
Well, let me comment on that for just a minute before I go there. This just expresses that God has a will for our lives. God has a will for our lives. And it's very important that I find it, that I pray for it. Because, again, it's a source of joy for us. It's a source of blessing for us to find the will of the Lord. Amen. Um, Matthew 21. Uh, oh, you know, let me get there. Matthew 21, 28 through 32. But what do you think about this? A man told two sons. He said to the older boy, son, go out and work in my vineyard today. And the son answered, no, I'm not going. But later he changed his mind. He went anyway. Then the father told the other son, you go. And he said, yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They all replied, the first. Then Jesus explained the meaning. I tell you the truth, corrupt tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. For John the Baptist came and showed you the right way to live, but you didn't believe him, while tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even when you saw this happening, you refused to believe him and repent of your sins. Well, there again is the importance of the will of God. The importance of doing. If I want to be a good son, then I'm going to do the will of God. And it doesn't matter. Sometimes you're going to struggle with that will. That first son did. Ah, I'm busy. Oh, I want to do something else. But then he thought, well, I better do what my father asked me to do. And Jesus says he was, um, he's the one who obeyed the father. He's the one who did the will of the father. You can say, um, oh, yes, that's the will of the Lord. I, I know what it is. God calls us to it. But I also call you to that level of, of uh, commitment to his will. We need to be praying that the will of God is done in our life. I need to see it. and need to understand it. Because, again, doing that will of God is the key to the entrance to heaven. Doing that will of God proves that I'm a part of the family of God. Knowing that the will of God is good and doing the will of God is absolutely necessary for spiritual life. I've got to commit to his will in order for that will to be done in my life. I usually tell this story uh, in Russia or overseas when I'm doing a school of Christ. I went to Russia the first time in 1994, in February, the end of January, February of 1994. I went by the invitation of a, of my old college roommate, or one of them, my last year in college, uh, Roy Denton. Um, he, he was going uh, to move. He was moving from Moscow to Lithuania to Vilnius, and um, that's all he was doing. He, he hap, uh, off the cuff asked me to go with him, and I said, yeah, sure, I'll go. And so uh, God made arrangements. It was very good for me to go. A lot of people gave money for me to go. And, um, and, and so I, I went. As I said, it was really just a tour. Here's, here's the school. Here's, here's some people, some Russians, and here's a church. And then we were to go home in eight days, go, go back to Vilnius and go um, God had me hook up with a Russian pastor and leader, and uh, we went on a 30-day tour all of February, a 30-day tour of Russia. We preached everywhere we could, or uh, we did. We ended up teaching in uh, one of the School of Christ in Novocherkask in southern Russia. And um, God did marvelous things in my life. I, I tell you, I, I look back on those times with great fondness for what God did do. Showed me a lot about myself as well as worked a lot of miracles in, uh, in the lives of some 32 students that we had there. Uh, I praise the Lord for that time. You know, while I was there, I believe that God really spoke to my heart and said, this is what I want you to dedicate your life to doing. And, um, and um, really almost an audible voice that said, will you go uh, to Russia for me? 
I'm standing in, in, in the line coming home with a bunch of oil workers, and they were complaining, complaining, complaining what they had to eat, where they had to sleep. And yet they were earning double wages, whatever they were. They were earning double while in Russia. And uh, God said to me, they come for money. Will you come for me? And I said, sure, yes, I'll go or I'll come. I'll, I'll do it. And I spoke to my wife, and I don't know that she was too excited about it. She was okay with me going from time to time, um, uh, but she would rather not live there. And uh, <clears throat> I wrestled with it, put it on the back shelf for a while, looked for a fleece here and there, wanting someone to confirm what God had spoken to me. So finally, I was... Uh, I was I got away from my home church and went to speak at a at a neighboring church. It's pretty far away, actually. And uh, I, I, I laid out that fleece for the Lord. I knew that it would take about fifteen hundred dollars for me to to um, to live every month in Russia. So I said to God, God, if you'll give me fifteen hundred dollars, then I know it's you. I know that you're going to take care of me, and I'll I'll, I'll be willing to go. And so I preached two services. They gave me a check for $100. And $100 at that point probably wouldn't even got me home from where I was. And so I turned to the Lord in prayer. I said, Lord, I, th I thought you were calling me to Russia and to the school of Christ. And the Lord just simply spoke, yeah, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And I said, but God, why didn't you supply the financial resources necessary for this ministry? He simply said to me, Joel, I, I can't supply that until you're committed to the ministry. When you commit, I'll, I'll supply. You know, that's exactly what we saw. You know, I thought we lived by faith. We were pastoring a church, a medium-sized church in, in, um, in northwest Illinois. And God supplied all our needs. But when we stepped away, my wife was able to secure employment. Uh, I didn't have anything at the time, but God began to pour into our ministry. It took me a long time. It took me a number of months still to understand the extent in which God was going to supply. And uh, But after a time, I see that as, as God calls me to go, I step out in faith. The finances were always there to meet every need. There are times when we were down to almost our last penny, but God always came through. But he didn't come through until I committed to what God wanted to do in my life. And I'm, I, I guarantee you someone listening tonight is going through that very situation. You're arguing with God. You're laying a fleece out with God. God, what to do, what to do, what to do. God's waiting for you to commit to his will. Whatever it is, commit to his will before he can supply what you need. Father, I pray right now for that one that is in that, oh, on that pendulum, back and forth, back and forth, that they would commit to your will in their life. Lord, I know you're going to supply the need. You're going to make a difference in their life once they commit to whatever it is that you are asking them to do. And I give you praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope this has been an encouragement and blessing to you. I've sure enjoyed being with you. God bless.